Well, thank you first uh, for the invitation. Very glad to be here. Um, I will be presenting today uh, topics of the mass test exposure systems in microfabrication for the prototyping up to uh, high volume solution uh, for tomorrow, and I would add for today even. So. Okay. <laughs> it's not. Uh, okay, upside down. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So first, uh, just for a brief introduction of our center to give you a kind of a, uh, a background of where all this is coming. So uh, C2MI is the largest Canadian uh, R&D electronic center. Uh, um, so it's situated in Bromont, Quebec. Uh, it's more than $300 million uh, of investment uh, for infrastructure and uh, equipment, and it's still growing uh, as we speak. We're talking about uh, uh, 20,000 square feet of classroom from class 10 to class 10,000, 100,000, uh, 10, depending if you're in microfabrication, packaging uh, areas. Uh, it's actually bridging the academic to the industry, which was a big gap. Um, so uh, yes, we're using uh, industry level tools in compared to like more manual tools, so industry level tools, and we can also do small scale volume and niche production on our site. Uh, we're a nonprofit, doesn't mean that we don't make many money, but we reinvest all the money we make in new equipments uh, or new projects uh, for the ecosystem, actually. Uh, we do men's five microfabrication, we have advanced packaging, card attached, lines printed, uh, and flexible electronics. And we have to mention that we also have two world-class founding par industrial partners in the name of IBM and Teledyne Data that are our neighbors. So all this is making us making shorter time to market. Um, quickly, uh, just a few, uh, a few things that we're doing. Uh, so we're mainly a 200, micron, uh, 200 millimeter uh, microfabrication area where we do a lot of MOMs. Uh, picks, so uh, photonic ICs, whether it's silicon, silicon nitride, uh, we do uh, IMUs, RF filters, like F bar, bar filters, those things, uh, C mute, P mute, microfluidics devices, uh, gas sensors, uh, we have dicing and grinding services, a whole bunch of things like that, and with features, you can relate to a, a few of the things. Uh, we do, uh, we have also a, a big areas in advanced packaging. So uh, I've seen some presentation, there's some lack for some uh, companies. Uh, we can maybe help you out there. Uh, so all, all, all the tricks are there. Reliability, failure analysis is there. I invite you, if you need more information, just go on the website, Section Media. You can actually have a virtual visits of all our labs. That's talking even more than this. So uh, that's just a brief introduction. So that being said, just a little bit of history uh, to go back on the mask, uh, mask uh, the, the mask uh, in, uh, for, for mass fabrication. So basically, at the late 90s and uh, beginning of 2000, that was the golden age, let's say, of, uh, of uh, uh, the men's uh, microfabrication. That's where it was more coming to production. So there was two ways uh, that was happening. It was, it was happening, whether from top to bottom or bottom up. So there was some R&D labs that were just going more and more with volume production, having uh, those R&D tools used up a lot more. And there was some uh, legacy uh, CMOS foundries that were transferring to actually, actually to MEMS fabrication using these legacy tools if we go back at the mask uh, levels. So those are actually, actually yeah, we have tools, uh, it's here. Tools that uh, were used in the late 80s, beginning of 90s in the uh, CMOS industry that were used up for, for MEMS fabrication. So, um, uh, yeah, you have some here. Also new uh, MEM specialized tools, I would say, were emerging. Um, most of them were actually uh, R&D tools that were adding like a, a had on for automation uh, more and more at the beginning of the 2000s, late 90s. So that's how it, it began. But, but uh, now those legacy tools are really old. Um, no service, no repair, they're talk, talking 25 years, that's actually even a lot more than that, around 30, 35 years sometimes. They're not in 200 millimeters because at the time, it wasn't there even for the CMOS, those tools were more like 150 and, and less. 
So, um, and uh, the non-legacy uh, tools, like the, the other tools that I've shown you that were growing, are basically contact aligner, proximity tools. So really resolution limited and lithography, uh, corner effects, and uh, also, well, they use most often soda lines because quartz with those big plates that would be required for full field lithography are super expensive. So, uh, and if you're using soda line, that means that you have thermal expansion issues, run in, run out, and it's, bit, it's worse and worse the larger you are. So, um, so those are issues. I have to mention that um, uh, I've seen lately those, those tools, maybe there are some others, or I missed some, that are full field projection aligner that are actually, uh, could be a response lately that I, I see up here. But for, uh, and yeah, I just have to add also that uh, those uh, contact masks require re-cleaning and replacement because you clean them, you wear them, there's yield issues, so those are the problems. So now, back to the city of my history. Um, actually, if you go back our, in 2016, we had that workhorse, which is our SML back to front aligner, really interesting tool, but there's some limitation if you ever use a stepper. You, you're limited in the field, uh, so it, when you do men's, sometimes you have big dies. That's a problem because it's larger than the field. You can do tricks like stitching, multi-mask. That's really a pain, sometimes a big issue. Uh, die IDing is something we like to do. Not really feasible uh, with, uh, with the mask-based stepper. We can do some tricks, but it's limited again. Uh, and the contour wafer, the, the edge is really hard to, uh, to manage. Uh, because it's different, it has different features, and they don't fit into the stepper field directly, so problems. So we were uh, at the point, okay, we need, like every men's fab, we need a 1X aligner. So we have two choices. A typical mask-based lithography tool with very large mask, like uh, the contact aligner that we've seen with larger mask, or we go in a, at the second point where we see a tendency for maskless to be maybe a solution. But the question is, is it met mature enough and I, I, with enough throughput for production because we're a location where we want to move for production. So not like one wafer per, per day, and that doesn't work. So, and the answer is like, yes, somewhat. So let's see why I say that. Um, so, well, actually, massless lithography, well, direct laser writing was there forever. Uh, it's known, but it has a low output, but it's very versatile, so very interesting, but the what we need to do with uh, the, that technology is actually parallelize uh, the to, to, to have like thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of these beams, so doing at the same time doing its, their job. So now we can get to the right level of throughput. Um, so uh, with the avenue of some MEMS, MEMS development through the 2000, 2010s, the special light modulator uh, are, are arriving and are allowing us to think that could be possible. So here's the two, the two big ones. Uh, we've seen some pictures this morning. These are the micro mirrors from uh, the uh, Texas Instrument. And this is a GLV from a uh, uh, silicon like machine owned by sem uh, Screen sem uh, Semiconductor Solutions. So those are two solutions that are available in the market to do this trick, actually. And uh, well, the micro mirrors are self explaining a little bit. There's micro mirrors that are tilting. Uh, and the GLV, you have some representation here. Those are micro ribbons that are going up and down, and they're f you're phase modulating, uh, doing phase modulation to, to change the intensity, you have a zero to hundred percent of the intensity there, so you can play with like it's a pixel actually, so up zero and uh, and one. Actually, can be in between two with a grayscale as we see. Um, so, big, what what's the big difference between those two technologies? Um, uh, DMDs are two days, so they, they, they cover a larger area at, at the same time. So we're talking about a million, could be more than one million pixel, but requires a lot of control logic. That's slowing down the process a lot. That's one of the, call, uh, the, the problems with that technology. State switching is kind of uh, small, at 20 microseconds, uh, but it's, it's larger than the other one, as you'll see. Um, it's kind of bulky because it's a large micromirror. It needs to move. It takes a little bit of time and inertia there. Uh, and uh, while well, it can also wear out uh, since it's kind of a contact mems, as we, so there's some hinges and things that are rubbing to each other a little bit. That's that's could be an issue as, as far as I know. So if not, let me know. <laughs> uh, 
So uh, GLV are more, uh, th this is linear. We're talking about only like this, this example is 8,000 pixels. So it's a linear array. Uh, the state switching is probably like 10 times uh, better, uh, actually like uh, 100 times better. So we're in a nanosecond range. Power density can handle is, is like a lot higher. Also that has a lot to play. Um, it's constructed so, though for a single wavelength. So that's something you need to understand. So is, is the throughput enough for production? Well, that's an excellent question. So it depends on the definition, definition you have. So for CTMI, we define exactly, we have our own definition because frankly, you cannot rely on what's written on the flyer because it's a best case scenario in one condition that's not matching what you, what you need actually or what you will do. So make sure you, you define your specification. Uh, sorry, uh, define, define your yeah, specification in a way. Um, so alignment, uh, exposure field was like for full on 200 millimeter. Uh, the, the dose we're targeting is around that level, 260, uh, with four global alignment. Wavelength, it's important, 365. There's, there seems to be two major wavelengths in that realm, in that uh, field, 405 and 365. But those are using different lasers. And those lasers have completely different intensity levels that you can achieve. So uh, question to, to ask to, for your provider if you go there. Uh, resolution, smallest, smallest resolution, two micron. It depends if you have a 10X, a 5X, so it could be the magnification has a lot to do because of course you're gonna get smaller resolution but lower throughput, so it depends on your needs there. Uh, for us, it was more than 20 wafers per hour we wanted. At that time, screen was the only one that could achieve that. So in 2016-17, uh, and they achieved that with only one exposure uh, head. So it could be, uh, nowadays, if you ask questions, a lot of companies are offering multi-head to compensate for, you know, having multi-head to compensate for some lacks on, on, on some other sides. Uh, so it's something you can re request also have, have a look. Some, some are, are able to do like decent numbers depending on your needs, five, 10, 15 wafers per hour. So something to, to see with the, the provider. So is it sufficient for your application? So quickly, that's the tool that we bought. Does it. So things are moving quickly. You should ask questions. A throughput is getting uh, a better. A resolution is getting lower. Alignment tolerances are getting lower. So all, all those things that were already five years uh, ago. So ask questions, those things are getting better. Uh, and there's like new programs and then seeing all those things. Okay, so the pros and what we see as a, a user, an end user. So it's really important to understand the benefits. They are direct benefits. There's no mask. So of course, core cost of the mask, storage, maintenance, cleaning of the mask, clean room space, uh, chemicals used for cleaning or all, all the above. Well, this is gone. Uh, well, no mask also means, well, there's no physical mask. No mask wearing, no defects, better yield. Could be, could be one way to look at it. And direct, indirectly also, when you can do, uh, with the mask test, you can change a lot. Uh, you can do many things with the, 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 the wafers, have multi-dyes, multi-design, multi-exposure level differences. So you can actually end up with less wafers to, to develop. So that the whole process of the wafer de development, actually for all those wafers you didn't do, it's, it, it's no cost and no, no for the environment, it's even better. Uh, so all those things. Time to market, first prototype, really important. For us, that we are doing a lot of prototyping, uh, multi dyes like I said, DOEs, multi-bias exposure to define window of operation. Uh, well, when you have an issue, it's a rapid, uh, a cheaper turnaround. Uh, so that, that leads to a many satisfied customers because the timeline is, is it doesn't have a hit or almost none. So this is very important. Um, we see a lot of uh, startups actually, uh, you imagine like a startup is coming, needs five wafers just to show it's working. Well, five wafers, 10,000 wafers, same amount of masks. So that's a, a lot. Uh, to, to, to take for a startup. Sometimes it's more than, we've seen more than 50% of the total cost of a project. So sometimes we have startups that just kind of do it because of that. So that could be an enabler because we're reducing the, the, the amount of money to put and time to put into that uh, endeavor. Um, so this is uh, 
some usage on our side. So you see where when we started having the, the carrier is the, actually the, the mask, the, the virtual mask we're doing. So we received the tool late 2019 and you see the, the, the volume <coughs> ramping up. This is a, just a partial year of like up February. So this year is, is gonna be probably more virtual mask than actual mask that we're gonna use. So that just to show a little bit how we do, uh, our the usage uh, is growing on our side. Uh, and it's an example of a, of a product, uh, actually, uh, just a phase one for development. It took 62 mask revision and option and tests to create that. And uh, talking, we're talking about 41 of those that were virtual. Uh, so that saved the timing, uh, that saved the whole, the whole project in, in a sense because uh, imagine that amount of mask if we do it each time we have an issue, it's, it's really saved the, 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 whole, the, the whole prototyping of that project. So really nice numbers. Uh, wafer distortion, uh, super interesting. Uh, of course, you don't have a natural mask, a physical mask. So you, if you have a good software, you can just, just change virtually the position and the distort the, 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 the mask itself, the virtual mask you're doing. And uh, so you can see here some, 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 some images that are showing that pretty much every vendor is offering that. This is an example of what we've done at C2MI to, with our partner, Teledyne Dasa. This is actually a, uh, some data from a wafer. It's actually completely junk because uh, we're looking for, let's say, 1.5 micron misalignment, and we're more into the four to seven micron misalignment. And here, after the, the, the usage of a mask less with a distortion uh, and uh, an answer, if you, if you will, uh, we're 100%. So we just saved the whole wafer. So that's a major thing. For pro and that's in production, actually. It's not development, this is production. So, um, traceability, uh, also something that's very interesting that we, we, we hear a lot. Uh, uh, we have a virtual mask, so uh, sometimes you can think of dye IDing. Typical dye IDing would just, uh, would just be uh, like having a, a dye ID for each dye, uh, a different ID for each dye on the wafer map. But actually, uh, we've worked with our collaborators uh, from screen, having the software being able to on the fly cope with the slot number and wafer number. So each die has a complete uh, ID identification. Each die is as a, like a lot number, wafer number, and uh, a unique ID on the wafer. So uh, that can be very interesting if you do uh, uh, automotive or medical. I can, well, uh, I think that can be very interesting for you. Um, yeah. Uh, traceability, well, that's kind of a question uh, that I have. Uh, so if you imagine all that flexibility, uh, and we can also change the font, uh, it can be changed, uh, dimension uh, can be changed. It could be a barcode, uh, it could be anything. So uh, that's my question for the industry, if you see, because I, I'm reading a lot of, uh, of uh, problems with the counterfeit uh, feeding of, uh, of uh, chips uh, in the military or medical, that's really a problem. Uh, and I'm just wondering if something could be done with that technology because you could think of, a, of a, an actual like uh, algorithm uh, generating uh, for encoding for each product, each client that is specific, kind of a secret code for, for, for yourself. So I'm wondering because sky's the limit, you just need to think about it, whatever it can, it can be. Uh, it can be on the mask because each mask can be different, actually. So it could be interesting. I'm, I'm wondering if you have any insight. Um, reconstructed dye, uh, wafers, sorry. Uh, so actually the tool we bought from screen was uh, first made for uh, final wafer level packaging. So it was for the packaging uh, side of, uh, of fabrication. So uh, of course uh, we can still do that. And uh, it's something we, we plan to, to investigate a little bit uh, at C2MI2 uh, over just putting each die. So the way it works, you, you, you're dicing the, 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 the wafer, you take the known good dies, you place them on a carrier, one die by one, and then you overmold and recreate like an epoxy style uh, wafers that is actually from uh, whatever dies you wanted. But each die is, has its own location, rotation. So the only way to continue working on that wafer is really to have a tool like that because there's no way each wafer is different for the traces that you're gonna put afterward. So 
Uh, that can enable also some very advanced packaging, like keywords that are there, like chiplets, heterogeneous assembly. You can think of all these weird uh, assembly you could do with different dyes side by side, uh, side by side, and recreating another larger die uh, afterwards. So all those things are possible uh, with a maskless aligner. Um, adapting to topology, uh, you can have like an autofocus that's going and just adapting compared to a mask where you have like the physical mask is a plane, so you can adapt just like with a plane. This one can be adapted real time. And uh, we work with, uh, uh, with screen on, on this one uh, to also do, uh, because in MEMS we do sometimes a lot of topology and we, well, actually the autofocus would be messed up uh, because of the cavities like here. So uh, if we just pinpoint like three locations at exactly where we want, we can define a virtual plane. So that can also be used. Uh, on those kind of, uh, of, uh, of tools. Um, yeah. uh, depth of focus, uh, the GLV has actually, uh, 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 by its construction, can, uh, is allowing very large depth of focus and actually in one dimension, it's actually infinite depth of focus here. Uh, so if you design your things well, you can think of doing things like that because you can make, put a trace and it go up and down inside a cavity because the depth of focus has exploded. So uh, I'm thinking of some interconnection, TSVs, interconnection, things like that. Anyway, uh, still don't know what to do with it, but there's plenty of things we could think of doing with this, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Um, Grayscale is possible. Uh, DMDs, GLV, the same. D different ways of doing it, phase modulation and pulse width modulation, I think the other one. Uh, so, but just to mention that something also possible, and we, we just started testing it at C2MI actually to see what we can do with it. Um, oh, that's if anybody here created a lot of photo mask <laughs> like I did, uh, that was a problem. Uh, so, uh, when you have a, a, an actual mask, you need to align through the mask to the wafers under. under. So, uh, you need to have like an open window to see through. Uh, and actually, even if you don't need to expose it for, for the device itself, you still have, you have it, so you expose it. Uh, and that can be a problem, let, let's say it's a TSV or something, you cannot have that huge pool open up because that doesn't match the rest of the process. Actually, with the maskless aligner, you just do a, an alignment and that's absolute coordinate and uh, you don't need to expose what you don't want to expose. And that's actually very interesting for, for somebody like me who had to cope with those um, mask uh, artifacts, I would say, uh, that we had, had no choice to go, to go around finding a way or uh, changing the process for it. Um, a little bit of caution, all those, uh, to, make, to make it industrial level, uh, with, it's all pixeliz pixelization based uh, at this point to, to have enough throughput. So you could get, in some cases, a little bit of pixelization. That's something we observed. Uh, of course, we're using very uh, high sensitivity, uh, high resolution resist, so it depends on what you're using, but uh, keep in mind that you know, those are very small lines, so, uh, but you can see a little bit uh, when you have uh, circular features or lines like that, it could, uh, could, could happen. Uh, also, uh, we, uh, because of the grid, and in, in our case, in the GLV, it's actually a rectangular grid, kind of atypical. Uh, you can also have like some uh, uh, address size, grid snapping, deformation. So that was at the beginning, we didn't know, so we didn't design for it, and this is what happens. So if you don't design well, you need to understand in the design how it's gonna be exposed a little bit there. Uh, and, and just a, a note here, like for a CAD tool, uh, the, the, the company who's making CAD tools, could be interesting to allow us to have like a grid that's not square. It's maybe rare, but I had the case. <laughs> so it could have been interesting for me. Uh, light intensity, uh, actually the GLV uh, can cope with 10,000 times the amount that is normally used with our steppers. And uh, so not all re the resist wasn't done initially to cope with this. So if you're lucky, you get a good resist, that has no problem. If not, you can get some issues. And we had to go to, uh, to, to some um, test, test math actually we've done so you see here how we can change the power of, because there's, there's an attenuator within the tool to make it like lower intensity at the wafer, uh, uh, the dose and the speed. So we create like a map and we, we see where the issues are. And the issues is really like nitrogen is 
creating bubble because it's too quick at the exposure. So you, you have like those issues. Uh, something to bear in mind, you need to test for each wave, uh, each reset. We, we've seen some reset are working, some are, are working so-so, and some is completely no deal. So something to think about. Um, yeah, possible improvements, I, I want to, to say. So yes, it's a, it's a new technology. So of course, at the time, I would say the price is still high, and uh, maintenance uh, for, uh, and, uh, and the price for high power lasers that are used is really something to check because that's very expensive. Um, maybe better illumination, uh, uh, better uh, lasers, I, I don't know, semi, semi, uh, solid state laser for 360, around 365 could be interesting because they're lower maintenance, something to look into. Uh, resolution uh, is getting better, something to check, it could be better. Uh, but it's already not so bad, if you ask me, because there's other specialized tools for smaller than one micron, but uh, I think it's going that path. Uh, overlay could get a little bit better. That's something maybe to look into, because they have like such a good machine with interferometer stage, and uh, companies in the 90s were doing like 100 nanometer overlay, so I guess it's possible. Um, able to work with 3D SML stepper, uh, that's something we have to do for advanced MEMS. Um, and uh, and it, it's kind of limited because of the way the SML is constructed with a 3D, so it's going through the stage and with very, very small window that requires uh, a first wafer centricity, so the first exposure needs to be repeatable within 45 micron, and that's really hard, <laughs> really, really hard, so maybe something possible. Uh, I'll try to go quick. I'm pretty sure I'm losing uh, the track of time. Uh, 3D patterning, it's okay, mate. Um, yeah, so, uh, alignment, yeah, uh, front to back IR, something necessary for the MEMS industry. They're not all equal uh, on, on this. Some are, are missing some, some of those options. Uh, wafer and link, always a problem. Management of very large CAD is an issue, I think, because that can be very huge files. Uh, so something to, to still continue working on. I think it's getting there, but uh, uh, it, it's a problem because we're talking gigabyte kind of, uh, of database there, so uh, could be large files. Um, Takeaway messages, uh, I'll go quickly, it's all things I've mentioned, but uh, it's the, the mask uh, uh, exposure systems for high throughput, I think are there, uh, something to continue monitoring, but they are there and it's improving. Um, uh, uh, pixelization is to be considered uh, or understood understand that it's there, it can create an issue or not, depending on, on, on what you're doing. Um, resolution is actually very comparable, uh, favorably even to, uh, to a contact aligner, I would say. Uh, so it's, a, it's the same realm, so there's no, no trade-off there. Uh, process development, time to market, it's a, it's a must, almost. As you saw, it's very advantageous to be able to switch within an hour and create a, a new mask, virtual mask. Um, no defect, replacement, uh, wafer distortion compensation is, is really interesting. Very, very large depth of focus could be used. Um, it, it could be considered as a more sustainable approach for the future of wind conductor also. Um, uh, yeah, some, some, uh, some IDing, some uh, adjustment for each wafer can be done. Very advantageous. So, uh, yeah, and that's basically it. So just to finish, just uh, to be fair, uh, there's the three equipments I see that are there for uh, high volume production. There's others with more tabletop approaches, but those are the three main guys I, I would follow. Uh, uh, like uh, um, the MLE from uh, uh, EVG, there's a Heidelberg having a, a tool also, MLE 300, and there's also a smaller version. And uh, of course the one we got, that is show it's working, the DW3000 by screen. Um, and that concludes it. Uh, if you want more information, I have an article that you can read, maybe some more insight. Um, you can uh, just follow C2MI on LinkedIn, and so there's some news sometimes. If we figure out something, we're gonna post it. Uh, contact me, and also special thanks to my colleague, Etienne, that uh, worked a lot on that tool and created some of the pictures there. David, that is the front screen that is here, and you, you have his uh, email if you ever want to contact them. And uh, Atano uh, Akito, who is a Japanese is also uh, responsible for the product, I think. Yeah, I, I, I that. So that's it. Thank you very much.
Yeah. Too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I, 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 I was going to say we probably don't have time for questions here to, to move along, but there is a question in the back. Real quick. Go ahead. I've read some things, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I don't have your insight, so perfect. Yeah, so it seems that the, for the benefit of everybody, uh, the, there's no wearing. I had a line, it, it was saying that it's more mechanical and the DMD as an RCLE could be prone to wearing. It seems that it's not the case. Uh, so I'm sorry, uh, but I, I've read that somewhere, but uh, yeah, I'm not an expert in that, that field. I was just wrapping up all, all the pros and cons I could see, but maybe I was wrong on this one. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks again, Carl. Thank you. Yeah, great. great.